<clears throat> hey friends, I hope you're here to talk mental health and entrepreneurship with me because that's why I'm here. This is probably one of the topics that I am asked most about, not only because I have been self-employed since 2010, but also before I started my own business, I had been in the field of mental health. It absolutely informs my thinking on many, many levels. And many of the people who choose to work with me say they do so, <clears throat> not only because I know how to start and run and sustain a successful solopreneur business, but because I infuse my understanding of mental health in self-employment in all the work that I do. So if this is your first time tuning in to my live stream, welcome. My name is Diane Wingert. I am a licensed clinical social worker and business owner, and I work with primarily neurodivergent solopreneurs. They are creatives, they are small business owners, they are predominantly female, although I do work with people of all genders, and <clears throat> many of them struggle with their mental health. Now, there are many people who say that <clears throat> being an entrepreneur is the best personal growth path you could possibly take, and that may be true. Partly because when you run your own business, you learn things about yourself that you might not have any other way to find out. Meaning, you become intimately acquainted with your strengths and your struggles. Many of my clients do not realize how much they depend on structure, systems, and support until they become their own boss. It's a strange paradox, but many of us chose the entrepreneurial path because we didn't want to have a boss. Now, that's a very different decision than saying, I want to be my own boss. You see the difference? Because not wanting to have a boss often means we don't want someone else to decide and dictate what our day-to-day -day work is going to look like. We may not want someone literally telling us what to do or how to do it. Especially if you are neurodivergent, you may very quickly get the answer, but you might not be able to show your work. So when you have a boss, when you are in the traditional workplace, <clears throat> if your boss demands to see how you did what you just did, but you are someone who thinks differently, like I am and like maybe you are, it can be really hard to show your work. So that among many other reasons, maybe why we chose the entrepreneurial path. Maybe we just can't tolerate the boredom of the workplace. So we need to do our own thing. Maybe we struggle with our mental health and we need to be able to work non-traditional hours that honor our need to Maybe take a nap in the middle of the day, or maybe we do our best work after 10 p.m. There's not a lot of jobs where you can do that. Now, I do think the world of work is beginning to change, is beginning to evolve, and the smart businesses are beginning to wake up to the fact that the traditional workplace is really not very hospitable for lots of different people, not just those of us who are neurodivergent. The traditional workplace is not hospitable for working mothers, that's for sure. It is not hospitable for people who don't fit neatly into a preordained box. People who have responsibilities that come unexpectedly, like let's say you have a, a child with special needs, or let's say you have an aging parent who's dealing with a health condition. It can be very difficult for you to meet the needs and those obligations and still conform to the expectations of the traditional workplace. So one of the reasons why many of us become entrepreneurs is because we need to do things differently. And what we find is once we are out on our own, <clears throat> 
that we really depended on the structure, the systems, the social outlet, the routines, and frankly, the expectations of the workplace to keep us focused, productive, and reaching our deadlines, especially if you have ADHD like I do, that can be one of the biggest adjustments to working for yourself. And it can take a long time to figure it out, which can lead to difficulties with your mental health. It has been said, and it's actually been published by people much smarter than me, that, <clears throat> excuse me, those of us with mental health conditions, whether that's anxiety, depression, ADHD, autism, and many other conditions are more likely to become entrepreneurs than those who do not have these conditions. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because you may have to go to doctor appointments more often. <clears throat> if you're bipolar, for example, and many entrepreneurs are, you may go through periods where you are in an elevated state, you're moving into hypomania or mania, and you need to see your doctor frequently for medication adjustments because that will keep you from needing to be hospitalized. If you're working for someone else, you may not be able to work in those frequent psychiatry appointments to get yourself stable. Your behavior would certainly be noticed by others in the workplace and not in a good way. You may find that because you suffer from anxiety, your anxiety is worse when you are in a workplace with a lot of people around you. If you have ADHD, even if you have your own office, you may find the traditional workplace too distracting for you. If you <clears throat> suffer from depression, even if it's well managed, your energy level may fluctuate and you might need some accommodations in the workplace. And let's face it, even though here we are almost to the end of 2023, the workplace is not terribly accommodating for people who have any kind of special needs, including those of mental health. So I sometimes think about it as a chicken and egg situation. Are people with mental health conditions more likely to become entrepreneurs? The answer is yes, either because we quit jobs that are inhospitable for us because we're less willing or less able in some cases to tolerate an inhospitable work environment. We might get fired more often. We might have more difficulty finding a suitable workplace because we have some different needs. Or we might end up having a boss who has zero understanding and zero tolerance for mental health issues. There's so many different reasons. But another reason why people with mental health conditions, particularly those with ADHD, which is what I am most familiar with, may be more likely to become entrepreneurs because their creativity, because they're fast thinking, because of their difficulty tolerating boredom and monotony like meetings, makes them predisposed to having difficulty conforming to the norm. And they may choose to follow an entrepreneurial path because the workplace, and even in a creative workplace, may not be a good fit for them. I've used the comparison that many people <clears throat> are daisies. Now, daisies are an attractive flower, but they're basically weeds, meaning they can grow anywhere. They can grow under any conditions. And many people are daisies. They can work in many different types of environments, even those that are not particularly well suited to them because they're more adaptable and because they don't have special needs. <clears throat> those of us who are neurodivergent and those of us who have mental health struggles due to our neurodivergency are more like orchids. Orchids need special treatment, special handling, special environments. Now, do I think people who have these differences are more special? In some ways they are. I think that there is ample evidence <clears throat> that many of the world's highly creative people have mental health conditions. 
there is some very interesting information about being touched by fire. And many people who are bipolar are extremely creative during periods of hypomania and even the beginning stages of mania. Now, I don't think anybody would want to be bipolar in order for that to be a gateway to greater creativity, but there is ample evidence that many people who have bipolar disorder and are creative people have periods of enhanced creativity when they are having an episode of their disorder. Believe it or not, there are people for whom their depression has been the source of some of their greatest creativity. Some of the world's greatest writers and artists have been known to produce their best work during periods of deep depression. Can you imagine these individuals working for a boss in any kind of a traditional or even non-traditional workplace? Probably would never happen. So my point is this, if we have a mental health condition and that makes us more predisposed to the path of entrepreneurship and in fairness, probably more likely the path of solopreneurship because when you work for yourself and you work by yourself, now that means you may have a team, you may have a team of employees, you may have a team of contractors, you're more likely to have a virtual team that allows you to create a business and a lifestyle that takes your needs into account at every level. How could this look? How does it look? Well, many of the clients that I work with, when we first begin working together, they may need a little bit of permission to proceed. What I call permission to proceed, meaning they actually need to choose to believe that it is okay for them to create a business and a lifestyle based on their unique needs and gifts. I think it can be very difficult for us to give ourselves that permission. But when we encounter someone else who is what I call like-minded and like-brained, maybe someone like me, who tells them it's not only okay for them to create a business and a lifestyle that is uniquely suited to their particular needs, wishes, wants, preferences, priorities, and mental health condition, it's a necessity because they will struggle more elsewhere. Years ago, when I first got diagnosed with ADHD, a very impactful conversation I had with an ADHD coach went something like this. You've spent decades trying to fit in, trying to conform to the norm, trying to blend in, trying to behave like everyone else, which I now understand to be masking. Maybe it's time for you to bend the world to you. I've never forgotten that conversation because it was essentially being given permission to figure out who I am and how I am and how I need to live and work in a way that honors my unique needs, honors my mental health, allows me to build a lifestyle and a business that I could right size to my preferences, my gifts, the way I need to work as a result of my mental health needs and my stage of life and you can do the same. You don't even have to hire me to get that permission. Consider watching this live stream, permission granted. Because the reality is this, when we right-size our business, when we create and sustain a business that is uniquely suited to who we are, including our mental health challenges, we are going to be less symptomatic. You heard me, our mental health symptoms will be less when we are working in a business and with a lifestyle that we created with those things in mind. It's perfectly logical, right? If I'm a person with ADHD and I am, 
and I'm at the stage of life that I am, one of the difficulties I have is getting enough sleep. Why? Well, because at the end of the day, when my medication is worn off and I'm not as focused as I am when it's on board, on, on board with my brain, I'm more likely to indulge in things that let's just say I'm a little bit more impulsive about, like TikTok. I might be more easily distracted. I might be thinking it's time to go to bed, but I want to do one more thing. You know, one more thing, itis is a common trait for those of us with ADHD. So getting to bed on time is a struggle. It is a struggle for most people with my kind of brain. So if I have trouble getting to bed and I don't always honor my systems, I usually do. I have systems that support me to do the things I know that help me feel and function at my best, but I don't always follow them. So if I choose to ignore them or I get distracted and I don't, I don't follow them and I don't get enough sleep, the next day is going to be more difficult. It's going to be more difficult to focus. It's going to be more difficult to be creative. It's going to be more difficult to maintain my energy. But because I work for myself, I can fit in a nap during the day. Or I can fit in some kind of low-level exercise, like a long walk, to kind of reboot. I couldn't do that if I was working for someone else. Now, I mentioned that it's like a chicken and egg situation because it's true that people who have mental health conditions are more likely to become entrepreneurs for the reasons I've mentioned and many others. It's also true that many of us struggle as entrepreneurs. So this may sound contradictory. If you have a mental health condition, you're more likely to become an entrepreneur. True. And it can be more of a struggle for you to be an entrepreneur. Because even if you're a hardcore introvert, the isolation of working by yourself and for yourself can really get to you. And many people did not realize how badly it can get to them until the quarantine that went on for over two years. Many people got intimately acquainted with just how much they need to be around other people, even if they're not interacting with them. You know, many people who are writing, who write for a living, who've been working by themselves and for themselves for years, but don't want to be isolated, would go work in a coffee shop or may work in a co-working space or a public library or any number of other outlets. During the quarantine, that was cut off. Did they become less productive? Did they struggle more with the symptoms of anxiety, depression, ADD, whatever their diagnosis is? Did they find it more difficult to meet their goals, to maintain their productivity, to manage their obligations and their deadlines? You better believe they did. And a lot of people who have had their depression under good control had a relapse during the extended quarantine, which makes complete sense. So it's true that if you have a mental health condition, you are more likely to become an entrepreneur. But what's also true is the stress, the isolation, and the instability and risk of being an entrepreneur absolutely makes entrepreneurship possibly hazardous to your mental health. It's neither one nor the other. It is the chicken and the egg. If you have a mental health condition, are you more likely to become an entrepreneur? Yes, you are. If you are an entrepreneur, are you more likely to struggle with your mental health? Also true. Why? Because entrepreneurship is isolating. It is scary at times. You accept more risk more uncertainty, more instability. If you are seeking funding from others, let's say you've got a tech startup, which is what most people think entrepreneurship is all about. The number of people whose entrepreneurship journey is because they are the founder and CEO of a tech startup, the number of those individuals is actually tiny compared to the number of individuals who are working by themselves and for themselves as small business owners, 
creatives, freelancers, gig workers, and independent professionals who are the sole support of their financial income. Now they may have a partner, they may have income from other sources, but simply being responsible for generating and managing your financial security, that's a lot of responsibility. And it can feel very, very scary if you are in an industry that is currently being disrupted, if you are in an industry that is seasonal, if you are in, in an industry that is being impacted by what's going on around the world economically, politically, socially. I mean, there's no doubt that the world of work is changing dramatically and suddenly, and that that change is proceeding at an increasing pace. So anybody who's self-employed is possibly dealing with a greater level of instability, a greater level of uncertainty, a greater level of doubt. All of those things impact our mental health, obviously. I've got an upcoming episode of the Driven Woman Entrepreneur podcast where I'm going to be talking about getting better at making decisions. Because what often happens for many of us, many of us, and I find in particular those of us who have ADHD, often describe ourselves as a quick start, or I get an idea and I go into action immediately. Many of my favorite clients describe themselves that way. But here's the thing. If you always make good decisions, if you have incredible spidey senses about what risks to take, then being a quick start is awesome because it means you're going to get ahead of the game. You're going to be out there in front of the pack and other people are going to be trying to catch up to you. And that is an absolute, maybe you call it an unfair advantage in the business world. Recognizing an opportunity and being quick to act. However, if you are not a particularly good decision maker, if you are more impulsive, as many of us with ADHD are, and you really don't have all the information that you need to make a great decision, you might just be making an impulsive one. Now, that can be really chaotic if you have a team. It can create a tremendous amount of financial risk if large sums of money are involved and you don't happen to have large sums of money. So it's not necessarily always a good thing to be someone who can make rapid decisions and take rapid action. You may find that your business is rapidly moving towards bankruptcy. But if you overthink decisions, if you are a perfectionist about everything that you do, and many women with ADHD, who tend to be more of the ADD type. They're not as hyperactive. They're not as impulsive. They tend to be more inattentive and distractible. And those traits come with a lot of thinking, 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 overthinking, perfectionism, procrastination, rejection sensitivity. You see where I'm going? This whole cluster F tends to lead them to having a great deal of difficulty making decisions. So I think about it like both ends of the spectrum can be problematic when it comes to decision making as an entrepreneur. If you're too impulsive, you're going to make some bad decisions and some of them may be difficult to recover from financially or otherwise. But if you overthink your decisions, if you are a perfectionist, if you have to keep looking for more information, keep looking for more options before you can make a choice, then your problem is going to be one of missed opportunities. Other people are just going to beat you every time because you're taking too long to make a decision. So an upcoming episode, uh, and this does relate to mental health, is how to get better at making decisions that you feel confident in and that you can live with. Because Decisions that are made too impulsively can lead to unnecessary risks. And decisions that take too long 
to be made result in missed opportunities. Both of these are related to our mental health, both because if you are ADHD and, and impulsive, you're going to end up with the first category. If you're ADD and an overthinker, you're going to end up with the second category. Missed opportunities in business are very, very stressful, and they tend to lead to a lot of depression because when we overthink something and we miss the opportunity and somebody else who isn't an overthinker takes action, even if we do it, we look like we're chasing them. That's not a good feeling. So getting better at making decisions, I think, is going to help us manage our mental health better as entrepreneurs. So listen for that episode on the Driven Woman Entrepreneur podcast. It's coming up in just a couple of weeks. So to wrap up for today, I think the last thing I want to say about the entrepreneurial path and mental health is that most of us decided to become entrepreneurs because of this notion of having more freedom, having more flexibility. And in many cases, that's a fallacy. It's really not true. Why? Because <clears throat> we often don't have the support that we need to be as productive as we actually need to be. And especially if you are a solopreneur who does not have a team, so you are literally wearing all the hats, it's going to be hard for you to convince yourself that you need to make self-care, including mental health care, a priority. Why? Well, I have these conversations with people all the time. They'll tell me I know I need help, but I, I can't hire someone. I know I need to exercise more, but I don't have time. I know I should get more regular sleep. I know I should eat better. I know I should meditate. I know I should drink more water. You know, basic self-care stuff. And by the way, self-care is not getting your nails done. That's grooming. That's maintenance. That's like mowing the lawn or flossing. The kind of self-care I'm talking about, the kind of self-care that actually helps maintain your mental health, which is absolutely necessary for you to maintain your business and not burn out. That kind of self-care, the basics, <clears throat> the stuff your mommy tried to tell you many years ago and you fought her to the nail, getting enough sleep, eating nutritious food most of the time, hydrating because it's really hard to think and have energy when you're dehydrated. Trust me, most fatigue is not because of your hormones. It's because you're dehydrated. So go drink some water as soon as you finish watching this. <clears throat> the kind of self-care I'm talking about that will improve your mental health is this kind of self-care. Getting enough sleep, being adequately hydrated, eating nutritious food most of the time moving your body. You don't have to join a gym. You don't have to start running marathons. You don't have to become a weightlifter, but you need to move your body. And you need to have a way of managing stress. And I know this is a hard sell because everybody knows it, but few of us actually do it. And most of us resist it tooth and nail because we all think we don't have the time to do these things. I really want to encourage you to figure out <clears throat> what would be optimal for each of these things and what is the minimum viable. If you're an entrepreneur, I know you're familiar with this concept of minimum viable. What is the minimum viable amount, let's say, of movement, movement you need to get every day? Maybe it's 10 minutes. Maybe it's 10 minutes, three times a day for a total of 30. Maybe you need to get out of your chair and move your body for 10 minutes. And if you happen to have a dog, that's a perfect excuse. And if you happen to like podcasts, mine or others, that's a perfect excuse. 
That's the kind of multitasking I am in favor of. Because most of us are literally growing roots out of our behind into our chairs. Because we sit in front of these computers for hour upon hour upon hour. And the only thing that gets us out of the chair is usually that we have to go to the bathroom or someone else is insisting that we spend some time with them if we want to stay married. Am I right? Your mental health depends upon it. It really does. And your business depends upon your mental health. This is something that we need to do. We need to take it seriously. So maybe the first thing you do after watching this is you decide that you're going to walk. You're going to get up and you're going to move and you're going to take a walk. At this time of year, it'd be a great idea to get out of your house and take a walk outside, which yes, that means you have to put on some clothes, right? So you put on some clothes and you get up and you take a 10 minute walk and you take your dog with you and you pop in your headphones and you listen to a podcast and you allow yourself to do that three times a day. Now, are you going to get in great shape because of that? No, of course not. But it's a very, very, very important act of self-care. Have you heard the expression, sitting is the new smoking? That's really good. Because while there may be a lot fewer smokers in the world today, there's a lot more sitters. And the reality is, if you are a solopreneur, I don't have to know you to know that you sit way too much. And there are many negative health consequences from all that sitting, including mental health negative consequences. So I've been lecturing long enough. It's time for you to go move your body. And if you want to learn more about entrepreneurial mental health, check out this week's episode of the Driven Woman Entrepreneur Podcast, where I do a deep dive conversation with my colleague and friend, Shulamit Berleftov. She, like I, are, is a self-employed entrepreneur. She also has ADHD like me. She is a licensed therapist like me, and she works with entrepreneurs like me. I focus on their business, and she focuses on their mental health. It's a really good episode. And come back in a couple weeks and listen to the episode I talked about with decision making, because being able to make good decisions in the right amount of time with better outcomes is absolutely not only going to make you a better business owner, but a more mentally healthy business owner. That's all for now, friends. I'll see you here again next week.